And once again, we're back to Horeb by Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch. And today we're learning about the love of God. The previous chapter was fear of God. This is love of God. And we've done the first two paragraphs, which begin with uh, part of the Shema. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy might. And in a brief review, uh, Rev. Hirsch uh, explains that when you're aware of all that you've been given by God, it's almost irresistible not to have a love, and that this love expresses itself in many different forms. Uh, he goes on to say, O oh, you young men and young women of Israel, would that you could but grasp the deep happiness enshrined in the proud thought, I am an entity of God's world. This is a theme Hirsch comes back to over and over and over again. To understand that you are on the right team. Right? That you are on the, you know, that you are part of, you know, God's very direct plan for this world is something that should give you a tremendous uh, strength and power. Um, you know, when we're in the presence of a great person mm -hmm. and they turn to you and they say, you know, what you did was important. Suddenly, that thing that you did takes on tremendous value to you that you may not have perceived it to have when until it was pointed out by this person who you have tremendous respect for. How much more so you know, is the decision that you make to, you know, buy something that's kosher over something that's not kosher. It's not a big deal. You know, that you wake up in time to get to Dalim. That you see somebody on the street who is in need and you give them a coin. And, and even more important, a good word and a smile. Um, they're all little things. But since they are intricate parts of God's plan, and you are an intricate one, those things become very, very great in, in the world of spirit, spirituality, and in, in the world of eternity. There's a very famous story told of Anshul Rothschild, who was the founder of the Rothschild Empire. Is the, the patriarch the main one? The, yeah, he was the okay. first one. First There's one. a beautiful story, I'll tell you sometime, about yeah. how he came to his wealth. Oh my. It's an absolutely amazing story. We'll, uh, I'll tell you about it mm -hmm. another time. But in his old age, he was, uh, his accountant came by, and they were evaluating his wealth. And the accountant said, can you give me the books of your real assets? Right? And he reached, you know, over to his bookcase and handed him a book with a lot of figures in it. And the accountants thought, uh, you know, Rabbi Anshal is getting old. He, he, said, he said, no, no, this is your book of tzedakah. <laughs> you know, the list of who you give tzedakah to, right? He said, I want the, the list of your real assets, mm. you know, your hard assets. And first of all, <laughs> this is tzedakah. <laughs> it's right. He said, Rabbi Anshal said, you don't understand that when time comes and I'm 120, what do you think the value of a diamond is? What's the value of real estate, of vineyards? Right. What I have that is a value, eternal value, is this book here. Mm. These are my mitzvahs. These are the chesed that I've done. These are, this is my stewardship of God's wealth. God gave me all this wealth. And this is what I did with it here that I can be proud of, mm. that I can show. Right. When I get to 120, this is the book that I need. No. Mm. Was, was his point. Right? So when we his his plea to to Jews here is that you should understand what it means to be an entity in God's world. Right. And to be the firstborn in a sense. Right? Would that from the blade of grass, the flower and the breeze, you learn to become imbued with the sublimeness which permeates all created things. 
which possesses the angels and which fills one with serenity and blessedness. Would that even for a fleeting moment you occupied the place which God has allotted to you but nay, you struggle and eke out your time in the pursuit of wealth and pleasure for yourself and yourself alone. And even the good you do is but for yourself, ignoring that you are the servant of God, Evet Hashem, God's Shlia, God's emissary. And by the way, you remain God's servant whether you do His will or not. <laughs> you remain His emissary whether you do His will or not. So it's a big concern. What is your behavior since you are God's emissary in this world? You know, nobody will ever confuse you for somebody who's not Jewish. Right? You don't need to wear a kippah. Right? The people who are concerned about your Jewishness will identify you as Jewish. So your behavior becomes an emissary of God. Mm -hmm. And we know, we see what happens when Jews behave badly in this world, that it's generalized mm -hmm. to all Jews. That's true. You know, and when Jews do a kindness in this world, and there are many kindnesses Jews do in this world, that it tends to be recognized as a Jewish thing at that point, too. So we remain emissaries whether we like it or not. <clears throat> Which is, by the way, the source of self-hatred. Yeah. Is that people think, I'm just like everybody else, you know, and if I don't want to carry this yoke of Torah, this burden of being Jewish, I'll change my name and I'll, you know, <laughs> you know, dress differently, act differently, and they'll be fine. N it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. We are identifiable as Jews. Whether we have beards or payas, whether we wear a shaito or a long dress, at the end of the day, the world knows it. There's something about us. Mm. With the worldly possessions alone, with the enjoyment of pleasures, you are nothing. Perhaps as a physical body, you may have some meaning, but created matter is subject to change. It wastes, it decays, it becomes merely food for creatures who are better better than you in that their life is devoted to such a purpose hmm. and who therefore fulfill better than you do their whole object of life. <laughs> what does it mean? Hmm. Right? So worms, right, which will eat your body when the time comes, you know, we specifically have holes in our coffins so that the body will decay faster. Right? Those worms do their requirement that God asked them to do perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. They just keep doing exactly <laughs> what it is. They never have a question. They never say, hmm, <laughs> you know, today I'm not going to go to work. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to do that. They continuously do it. You know, people want to have gar worms in their garden because it aerates the soil and whatever the reasons are. I don't know all about it. I'm not a gardener, but they have an important purpose in life. Those are the things that will take care of you when you leave this world. And if you are not doing what it is God asked you to do in this world, okay, then you're worse than the worms are <laughs> that are fulfilling his purpose. Um, but you... But you who are that quintessence, man and Jew, you persist in the emptiness of your spiritual outlook, declining to use your free will in the service of God. If only you could be elevated into serenity, into a condition which absorbs your whole self and provides you with serenity, only in God and in the Torah, which expounds your mission in life. Then would you cast aside your idols of silver, your idols of gold, your arch idol of pleasure, and all the baubles of your age to speed to God, so that you may realize yourself, you would then have become one who loves God. Hmm. Cast them aside? No. Perhaps you would at last really grasp them, Meaning, meaning all these things, the silver, the gold, the pleasures, right? Are we asking you to go and be a hermit in this world? To go live on top of a mountain, <laughs> you know, in a straw hut and weave your clothes from leaves? To cast away the idols of silver and gold and, and pleasure? No, we're not. Perhaps you would at last really grasp them turning the idol into an instrument, the bauble into something useful by devoting your whole being and energies to God 
and the fulfillment of his will. You will love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. I remember when somebody saying, you know, pizza. Pizza? Pizza. <laughs> pizza. What's good about pizza? I'll tell you what's good about pizza. There are people in this world who do snack and chat with a rabbi. What does it mean? They're not particularly religious young people, but they're interested in the pizza. So the pizza gets brought into a classroom once a week, and the rabbi shows up, and they enjoy the pizza, and they hear some words of Torah. And over time, many of them begin to repeat some of those words of Torah in their own homes to other people. You say, hey, that's cool. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Pizza is why they came. <laughs> pizza. Pizza was feeding their goof, their, their appetite, their animal hunger. Right? Use those desires. That's what Hirsch is saying now. Levavchem. Levavchem means literally not to love God with all your soul and with all your might and with all your heart. With all your hearts. Levavchem is plural. Mm -hmm. right? Why is it plural? It's translated singular. Mm -hmm. But it's actually plural. Right? Because we are often of two hearts. We often feel, you know, our body speaks to us and says, ah, <laughs> you know, I look outside, it's dark. Car to, carpool took my son to school. I was up until 2.30, 3 o'clock last night. I really need to get to the Minion today. No, no, no. <laughs> right? It's a completely legitimate feeling. Right? That's one heart. Right? The other heart said, wait, you out of your mind? <laughs> You're going to miss this opportunity? to daven of the minion, to be there where you always do and when you're close with those people, to have the unity with Hashem to daven, just so you can lay here in bed. The Chovetz Chaim used to say at that moment, he would say, Ah! I can't believe it! My Yetzir is up, out of bed, dressed and working already? <laughs> and I'm still here? <laughs> His Yetzir is working. What's going on? Uh, right? That's funny. Okay, he doesn't rest. Yeah. My Yetzir right? Look at him. He's on the job. He's on the job, right? making you stay there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and with that piece of knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, he would get up and off he went to that's shoot. That's a good way of looking at it. Right. If the Yetzir is working, then he obviously got up. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's not. He's not just working. He's in his tie and jacket. Yeah, he's got his yeah. shoes on. He's, he's yeah. already sitting in my bed, saying, "Say, eh. yeah, yeah." You don't have to really. <laughs> I don't have to get up and down, and you're already up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're yeah, cool. To love God with all your heart, with your mind and heart, for such is the meaning of love. Up. To strive to reach God with your mind employing all mental faculties that have been lent to you for recognizing God and for learning to know His will as expressed in His law and also His world in order that you may know how to fulfill His will in it. Right. So, just to back up a little bit, you know, the things we understand that the gold and silver that went into building the Mishkan in the desert was not dug in some holy mine, you know, <laughs> deep in, you know, the under the Har Harbias, in, you know, in Jerusalem. It was mined by the Egyptians. Right? It was Egyptian gold. Right? That did they have to destroy it? No, they had to elevate it. So, this is a dangerous concept that I'm going to explain, but I want to explain it because it's important. We do believe that there are many things in this world that we can elevate, right? I just gave you an example of pizza, mm -hmm. right? That's a human hunger, right? It's a, it's a desire of the body to feed itself. Right? So, we can use that. If I learn, I can eat something. It's not, by the way, the best thing from a point of view of health, um, but it's using my physical hunger to do a mitzvah. So, 
there are many things in this world that have a negative and a positive use. Most things do, if you think about them. Mm -hmm. you know, I can take this book and can I throw it at a child and hurt him, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or I can learn Torah from it. Right? Same book. Same book. Right? You know, and this is true of virtually anything in this world. So we're not expecting to abandon physicality in this world. We're expected to elevate it, you know. And our appetites, you know, appetites for food. Right? So before we grab and eat something, you know, we should be saying, Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Elohim Great Pre Hot Eights. Amen. Amen. So, before I said the bracha, I was taking God's food and eating it. After I said the bracha, God said, thank you, enjoy. Now it's mine. Much better way to eat it. It tastes better, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an idea that we take, you know, there's an idea of original sin. Yep. And sometimes connected with sexuality. You know, that there's something very wrong about our sexual desires, male sexual desires. Quite the opposite. Right? Male sexual desire, female sexual desire is a very holy thing. But it's a very, very dangerous thing when it isn't employed in a holy way. When it's between a married couple at the right time, the right way, it's you know it, it it's like a unification of God's God in many ways. We use a comparison when you read the Sfarad uh, Shabbos Friday night service. Right? There's a section called Kegavta, which uses the mashal of the unity of God and the Shekhinah. Right? This is a very very powerful physical drive that under the right conditions it's tremendously holy and under the wrong conditions is terribly destructive mm -hmm. this is true of eating this is true of satisfying all appetites mm -hmm. but when the appetites are satisfied in an appropriate way it's a tremendously holy thing so we don't believe in denial. In fact, when Nazir takes the oath of a Nazarite not to drink wine, not to have grape juice, not to cut his hair, there's a series of things. Right? After the 30 days of denial, right, he brings a korban, a sacrifice, to the temple. What kind of sacrifice is it? One might say it's a Thanksgiving sacrifice because he's thankful that he finished his period of Naziris and that he's you know on another level no it's actually a sin offering it's mm -hmm. a katas, right? what's the sin the sin is you lived in my world says God and you didn't take from the bounty I provided for you <laughs> that's an interesting way of looking at it why yeah, sure you denied my gifts terrible Right? For that, it's a sin. Hmm. Right? Now, maybe you were attaining a higher level, but it wasn't without doing something very wrong. Right? And so there's a, you bring the offering for that reason. Right? God does not expect us to live our lives in denial. Right? We have fast days. We have days of abstinence. We have days, you know, Shabbos is a day full of restrictions. It's the happiest day of the week. Mm hmm What's the, what's going on there, right? Because God has created a perfect environment for us there. So we should be very clear that it's not about, as he says, cast them aside. No, mm -hmm. but elevate them, use them in a positive way. You know, melt them down, and make an iron kodesh from the the gold that was an idol. You know. Okay, let's continue um, with your heart. Mm -hmm. um, in order that you may be able to go through the fight to which God calls you between the impulse which leads you upwards and the impulse, the Yetzirah, which drags you downward. 
and you may be able to make peace between the brute and the man and yourself, that you may be able to lift up the brute to the human level and make both impulses take one direction to serve Hashem, to call only that good and honorable which God calls so, and to avoid that which he wishes to be avoided, that your heart should feel only one attraction to your Father in heaven. So he's saying, wherever possible, elevate. Right? But know in the process, right? What are, you, what are you doing? You want to do that which is good and honorable in God's eyes. It's not a subjective thing. You know, we talked about this earlier. Yeah, right? so like you know, God's, it's not subjective. God tells us, and we, by the way, know it. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, when you've done something good, it gives you a lasting sense of fulfillment. When you've done something wrong, it may give you a, ter a, a, a temporary mm -hmm. sense of excitement. You know, like overeating chocolate, <laughs> right? It was really exciting at that moment. I loved the taste of it, and now I have a stomachache, mm. right? But there was a moment where it was like, couldn't have been better than that taste. Right? You know, people tell you that about that. But this, but when you're doing, you know, there's a guy at Steels and Bathurst. Mm -hmm. There's two guys at Seals and Bathurst, one going north, one going south, that are collectors. They're beggars. They're not Jewish, I don't think. Right? You've seen and them a few times, though. Many, many times. Mm -hmm. right? I actually look forward to seeing them. I like to help him. He's an elderly man. He's very pleasant. He gives everybody a bracha. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says, God should be with you, my friend, my brother, whatever it is. Yeah. He always has a nice thing to say, right? And by the way, even if you don't have any money, he has a nice word for you. you know, there have been cha occasional times when I passed him, and either I couldn't stop because traffic was moving, or I didn't have any money, and I waved and said, good day, sorry. Right? And, you know, still pleasant. Right? I actually look forward to it. Why? <laughs> I'm losing money on the deal. <laughs> right? losing money. Why? Right? <laughs> because I know that I'm helping somebody who needs the help. Right? And that uh, it seems to have a positive effect on the person. I feel better about it. I feel better about it. So he gained a dollar. I probably gained much more in the process. It's something always to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that these are decisions that, you know, we know that when we're confronted with a situation where we're asked to give, and we can, we should give something. Yeah. Um, and we're doing it for our own sake, right? We're mm. imitating God. God is giving constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with all your soul and with all your might. Um, this means <clears throat> that, that in the life which has been lent to you, and in your physical powers, in your health, your bodily fitness, in the resources which you have acquired, in the whole endowment which God has given you in the material world, money, business, honor, influence, friends, family, and all these <clears throat> that you may see only the means and instruments for accomplishing that which God in his law has meant to be accomplished, which your mind recognizes and your heart strives for. So just as your mind and your heart will have only one direction towards God, so your life and your possessions will be dedicated to this one effort. And you will become single-minded and active just as your God in heaven is the one is one and creative. Right. Now, if you misunderstand this, you will think that tomorrow you should go write a check for your entire value <laughs> to the local shul, <laughs> right? Because that's what it's telling you. Mm -hmm. No, very specifically, very specifically, he reminds us regularly about God in His law, right? So God in His law dictates, for instance, what it is appropriate for you to give. And there are limits on what a person should give. It's you know, and if you give beyond your limit, it's not considered a positive thing. Right? Why? Because it comes to this idea of being a steward of God's wealth. Right? If you have twenty million dollars and you give two million dollars of it away, right? So you have eighteen million dollars with which to invest and to continue to work with, right? And from that 18 million over the year, you'll probably get back three million dollars if you invest it well and handle it well. Right? 
So you go into the next year with $21 million, <laughs> even though you gave $2 million away. But if you give away the $20 million, you're starting from scratch. You may not make back the million the next year. The odds are you won't. Right. So God says, you're the steward of my money. You're the steward of my wealth, of my resources. That's what man is in this world. Handle them properly. And I will give you a detailed guide on how I want them handled. If then, if, then, if then your heart, your life, your wealth are only means for loving God, you ought naturally to love Him more than your heart, your life, and your <laughs> wealth. You should never hesitate when it is a question between abandoning the ways of God or the inclination of your heart, to throw away inclination, wealth, and life in order to remain true to God. So what he's saying is that we always have choices. Right, small choices, big choices. The more you understand your relationship with God, the more willing you, the more willing you are to make some of the very big decisions that might have appeared painful previously, but actually seem quite natural. You know, but we often wonder how is it somebody could do X, give that, have this kindness, sacrifice their life. I remember early in in my process of becoming observant, I had a thought, which I expressed, and I still hold by it, is that we give Avraham Avinu tremendous merit because he walked into the furnace mm -hmm. right? and uh, didn't hesitate when he was told, you have a choice, right? Tell the king, tell Nimrod that he is a god. And he is, you know, and you respect him as a god. Well, get in the furnace. <laughs> yeah. So, and the furnace meant certain death. Sure. Certain death. What's a stupid, foolish man? He can see that. <laughs> so, if you're Avraham Avinu, mm. not if you're David Ostrom, you're Avraham Avinu, you have this love affair with God. Mm. God refers to you as a hobby, as a, that which I love. You knew so much faith, right? do it what's the big test you have a test between denying God mm -hmm. or dying and going to a perfect world to come because you did it in God's name doesn't seem to me that it takes great courage actually mm -hmm. the only part that takes courage is your physical bodily fear yeah but think about how much worse your fear would be if you said, okay, I saved my life and all I did was deny God. Mm. Right. God who speaks to me, God who promises me and my family everything. Right. I mean, Abraham had, a, you know, a first-person relationship with God. Right. How could he have considered not walking into the furnace? I don't know. It doesn't seem to me that that was one of his biggest tests, actually. Shame on him who, turning means into an end, an end into a means, degrades the highest and exalts the lowest. Mm -hmm. Who, in order to increase his wealth, to enlarge his business, to in respect of men, to buy friends for himself, to build up his fortune as he imagines, or to satisfy his inclinations and passions, breaks even one commandment of his God. Mm -hmm. right. So, this is... A, a very important point that he's making is that you think that there's a shortcut, <laughs> not you, right? but the person who's doing this is a shortcut that, you know, by putting these hours or by cheating this person or by avoiding, you know, this, this fact, right, I will become tremendously wealthy and powerful. And by the way, he may even think to himself, and when I do, I'll give money to the shul. <laughs> right? Because that's that's the deal. I will yeah. do things that are completely against the will of God, but then I'll have this money, I'll give it to the shul. That's switching the ends and the means. Mm -hmm. right? God expects the means to be as clean as the goals are. Right? And if you see that the means that you have to accomplish that which you want to do are inappropriate, it probably means that the ends are really inappropriate mm -hmm. as well. And you're just fooling yourself about it. 
So it's an important thing to keep in mind when you're making judgments. We'll go a little bit further and then I'm sure. I'm getting to. And double shame <laughs> on him for the sake of any such advantage not only discards one command of God, one word of his Father in heaven, but turns his back altogether on God and says, I have no longer any share in the God of Yaakov. I will go to the nations and possess power and prestige who are not given over to feebleness and restraint and contempt. Heaven and earth blush for him, for he has forfeited his human dignity. His heart has no longer any idea of holiness, and the most holy merely amuses him. Mm. That if you think that you can trade the wealth of this world for the inheritance of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the inheritance of thousands of years of Yiddishkeit, of commitment to 